we've come to a point where we recognize that certain paradigms are no longer effective. The children don't respond to the harshness and fear-based and shame-based chinuch. But the question becomes, what do we replace that with? Uh, it's nice to be back in Crown Heights. I want to thank Junior Nishe for bringing me here. Why not? Yes, please. A applause for our organizers. Um, I like to speak in Crown Heights to Lubavitchers because then I can speak more directly. Here in Crown Heights, you guys all get my references and we've all studied the same books and we've all been shaped, hopefully our thinking has been shaped by, by the same Rebbe. And so that saves me a lot of time because I can just sort of say things as they are. So let me do that. I'm going to just jump in and say things as they are. Um, I think there's confusion today. I think there's confusion today because we've come to a point where we recognize that certain paradigms that were familiar to us are no longer effective. I'm talking about the old style of parenting that perhaps was quite popular and pervasive in previous generations, or maybe even not that long ago, a few years ago even. And we've come to a point where we realize that's not really what Toyota wants, it's not really what Chassidus wants, and besides for all that, it doesn't work. The children don't respond to the harshness and fear-based and shame-based chinuch. So we've come to a point where we realize that we need to unlearn some of the old models. But the question becomes, what do we replace that with? It's easy to just throw around words. It's easy to say, well, we don't want to educate children out of fear. We're going to educate them out of love. Okay, I agree. But what does that look like? What does that actually look like to educate out of love? And I think what's happened, I'm just saying this as an observer, is that in many cases, what we've done is we let go of stuff that we know doesn't work, but we haven't yet really replaced it with anything. So we know that we don't want to be so hard on our children that we break them, God forbid. We know that's not the path. But then what do we do instead of that? It's like, well, I guess nothing, right? Just stand back and let them do whatever they're going to do because we can't stop them anyway. And if we try to interfere, they're going to get mad at us. And God forbid, we're terrified that we're going to turn them off and they're going to go away from us. So it's like, yeah, maybe we've eliminated certain parenting styles that you might consider on some level to be abuse, but in many ways we've just replaced that with neglect. <laughs> and th neither of those are desirable. We don't want abuse or neglect. But if we don't yet know how to parent out of love, so then it's like we're kind of stuck. We, we know what not to do, but we're not yet proficient at what to do, and then just nothing happens, and then there's a lot of what we see, which is um, to use a, a Hebrew word, hefkerus, a lack of order, a lack of, a lack of direction. 
And then sometimes we think, well, maybe we should go back to the, to the old way. I mean, maybe it'll emotionally destroy our children, but at least, at least there'll be some type of order, there'll be some type of normalcy, right? And then we say, no, we can't do that, no. Okay, fine, so we have no choice. We've got to go back to <laughs> the new way, which is no standards, no goals, no guidance. And I don't really think anyone's to blame here. I just think it's a new skill set, and it takes a while to learn. And it's, and, it's, and it's radically new. It's radically new. I don't just mean it's new to us. I mean it may be new in terms of the entire timeline of human history. Because a lot of this has to do with the fact that Mashiach is coming very soon. And everything is changing, including and especially parenting. So we have to learn this whole new approach, this Mashiach Dika approach to educating our children. And uh, I think we need to be understanding of the fact that we haven't mastered it yet. And that's okay. But an evening like this is an opportunity to talk a little bit more about it and maybe to hear different ways of explaining it and allowing it to sink in so that we can start to be a little bit more comfortable parenting the new way, the loving way. So that's, that's what we're doing here. And like I said, we're in Crown Heights. I'm talking to Lubavitchers. I'm talking to the initiated. So I'm just going to say it straight up. You want to know what it looks like to get the best of both worlds? to be able to guide our children without breaking them or shaming them, to be able to get the best out of them, but also to show them how perfect they are already. You know, the paradox, the seemingly impossible contradiction. You want to see how those two seemingly opposite approaches are harmonized? The Rebbe. So that's, like I said, Crown Heights, Lubavitchers, I can say it like that. But let me support this statement because I think the examples will be helpful. Um, there's a story that the Rebbe told that basically sums up the entire new paradigm for our generation. Um, the Rebbe told this story at a Shabbos Fabrengen. It was right after Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamuz. It was Parshas Pinchas. Tovshin Yud Zayin. And you can look it up in the Hanachas and Tedas Menachem, Tovshin Yud Zayin. Also, it was included, the edited version of this talk was included in Lekut Yisichas Chelek Dalet in the back, in the Hisophis for Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamuz. Here's the story. The story is that the Rebbe Rashab was once on uh, vacation. He used to take trips for his health, at least ostensibly the reason for the trips were to visit different spas for healing. So he didn't have a lot of money. In fact, to the contrary, the financial situation was very bleak. And he came home, not home home, he wasn't in Lubavitch, like I said, he was traveling to one of the spa towns in Europe, but to wherever they were staying. And Rebetzin Shtern Asada, Rebbe Rashab's wife, was waiting for him. He came home and he was holding a new purchase, a uh, cane, a stick, a walking stick with a silver handle. And she knew that they had no money. She knew that if he bought something new, he bought it on credit. And she asked, what is this? So the Rebbe Rishab told the Rebbe Tzinshtan Asada that I just couldn't resist buying this as a present for our son. The Rebbe Rishab and the Rebbe Tzinshtan Asada's only child who was the Friedrich Rebbe. And he explained what it was that aroused his feeling of, of love for his child while he was, he was out and about, he was strolling, and 
he saw something that made him really feel strongly. He wanted to do something nice for his son, and, and he bought this stick, and he brought home the stick. And that's the whole story. <laughs> it doesn't sound that deep. It doesn't sound that cataclysmic. It's just, okay. But uh, in the Rebbe's hands, this story becomes the marching orders for a whole new paradigm, a whole new reality. So the Rebbe asks, okay, I get that the Rebbe Rashab was a loving father and he wanted to buy a present for his only child. But why that present? Why a cane with a silver handle? Okay, good question. So the Rebbe proceeds to unpack this story. And I should mention to you, and I think it's significant, that Rebbe says that the Fedek Rebbe never told this story publicly. The Rebbe says he told it to me privately. There are many things that Rebbe heard as privileged information from the Fedek Rebbe, things that we know now were Rebbe training. Fedek Rebbe was training his son-in-law to become his successor, and he was telling him things that really a Rebbe only tells to a Rebbe. And then the Rebbe turned around and took this information, this privileged information, and he shared it with, with us, which is another chiddish of the Rebbe. The Rebbe took Rebbe training stories, and he shared them with an entire generation. So the Rebbe explains the story. What's a stick? Well, a stick, everything's from Torah. In the Mishnah, in Aveda Zara, chapter 3 at the beginning, it says if you come to a town and you see a statue, and you're not sure, is it just ornamental or is it idolatrous? So the Mishnah says, well, it depends. If it's holding a stick, I mentioned some other things too the statue could be holding, but if it's holding a stick, then it's an idol because a stick is a symbol of rulership. The leader holds a stick, a makil. So the statue is holding a makil. It's a symbol of leadership, of dominance, and therefore you know that statue is an idol. So the stick represents authority. Now, with an idol, it's authority that comes from klippa, from the negative spiritual realms. But also in Kedusha, there's the idea of leadership and authority, which is also symbolized by a stick. So the Rebbe says that Rebbe Rashab, by giving his son this stick, was transferring to him a new paradigm of leadership, and proceeds to explain. There's a prophecy in Zechariah. You all with me? This is what the Rebbe does with a two-line story. <laughs> There's a prophecy in Zechariah. Zechariah sees these sheep being shepherded, and he sees two sticks you know, shepherds use sticks when they're shepherding. And he sees a makal noyam. What does that mean? A pleasant stick. And a makal chevlim. A stick of violence or brutality. This is what Zechariah sees in his prophecy. It speaks about it in, in a Gemara in Sanhedrin. It speaks about two different styles of rabbis says the rabbis in the land of Israel, they were more mellow, they were more peaceful with each other, they were the makal noyam style. And in Bavel, they were very harsh, like, like Russians, like Lubavitchers, you know, <laughs> they used to bark at each other. So that, they were the makal chevlim, they were, they were tough guys. But that's what it says in the Gemara in Sanhedrin. But in, uh, there's a mimer, a hemshech from the Rebbe Marash, the kocha, Tough Reish Lamed Zayin. So the Rebbe Marash explains that these 
two sticks represent two eras of Jewish history. And in turn, they represent two redemptions, two levels of redemption. Why is a stick related to redemption? When we left Mitzrayim, it says, Umakalachim beyadchem, Parshas Bay. Umakalachim beyadchem, you're going to leave with your sticks in your hands. But when we left Mitzrayim, what kind of a stick? You want to guess which? Was it the Makal Noyim or the Makal Chevlim? Was it the pleasant stick or the violent stick when we left Mitzrayim? The violent stick. Why did we need a violent stick when we left Mitzrayim? Because the Ra, the evil, was still so powerful that we're told, what does Tanya explain to us when it says, Kiborach Ha'am, that the Jews, they fled, they ran out of Mitzrayim. Why were they running? At that point, Pare was devastated. Who were they running from? And Tanya tells us they were running from themselves because the Ra was still so strong. If they didn't get out of Mitzrayim immediately, they would have fallen back into their comfort zone. The Ra within them would have overtaken them, and that's it. God forbid there would be no exodus. So they needed a makal chavlam. They needed a violent stick to address the evil. They needed to hit back the evil. But then when Mashiach comes, it's going to be vesruach atuma aver mina oritz. Hashem says, and I will remove the spirit of impurity from the face of the land. There will be no more evil. So you don't need to hit the evil. The evil's gone. So in that case, what kind of a stick are we going to have when Mashiach comes? This is what the Rebbe Marash explains. The makul nayam, the pleasant stick. So the Rebbe says, the Rebbe Rashab, in giving this present, this seemingly simple present, to his only child, his son, and future successor, by giving him this stick, he gave him a new model, an unprecedented model, a Gu'uladika model for leading. He transferred to him the Makal Noyam, the pleasant stick that we're going to use to usher in the redemption. And the Rebbe then explains that's why the stick wasn't a simple stick. What did it have? What was the handle made out of? Silver. Silver. Silver in Lashon Kodesh is kasif. Kasif is kisuf, longing, love. Nichsaif nichsafti. I've yearned and longed and loved and pined to be close, to return to my father's house. So the silver represents, you get the play on words, the kasif, the kisuf, represents the love. What's the makal noyam, the pleasant style of leadership? It's leadership with love. Now that doesn't mean that you abandon people. Now that you're no longer beating them with the makal chavlim, now that you're no longer br brutalizing them, it doesn't mean you drop them off and you say, okay, you're good, you're on your own now. I had two modes, rage and silence. The rage is over, now I'm silent. Right? No. No. When we go into the makal noyam mode, as the gu'ula draws near, we don't, leadership doesn't abandon us. Parents don't abandon children. Teachers don't abandon students. The Rebbe doesn't abandon chassidim. As we go into the makal noyam mode, to the contrary, we're just as involved, if not more involved, it's just a different style of involvement. And the Rebbe juxtaposes these two styles. What's the difference between the two styles? The makal noyam and the makal chevlim. The Rebbe says, the difference between the old way and the new way is very simple. He says in Yiddish, nicht brechen, not breaking, nor rather, ufhoiben, Unzuziehen, lifting up and drawing close. So instead of leading with harshness, 
with threats, with shame. Now we lead by telling people how great they are. That's Ufhaven, lifting them up. And by including people in our lives, that's Tzutzian, bringing them close. So it's not that we've stopped parenting. No, oh boy, now we've ashed, we're getting started parenting. Now the real parenting begins. Ufhaben und Zutzien, lifting them up and drawing them near. The Rebbe also describes these two paradigms in terms of Rotzein and Tainug. Lubavitcher audience here, so I know I can drop terms like that. But I'll translate it. Rotzein is will. Tainug is pleasure. In Crown Heights, everyone knows that Rotzein and Tainug are both makifim. They're both keser, right? But the difference between them, makif arochik, makif akorif, atik and arech, you guys all know this stuff. But what's the difference between Rotzein and Tainog. I'm not talking about in Seder Ishtalshlis, although obviously the way it's experienced down here in, uh, in human psychology is a derivative of the way that it happens in, in Eulamais. But let's talk about it in terms of the human experience. What's the difference between Rotzin and Tainog, will and pleasure? So the Rebbe says very simply, Rotzin brecht und Tainog zitzu. Will, willpower, breaks. Pleasure attracts. Those are the two paradigms, the old one and the new one. It's, it's broken down in the most simple language possible. The old style, Rotzein, willpower, it's my way or the highway, Rotzein brecht. When you lead based on willpower, someone's going to break and it ain't going to be me. Right? So when the leadership leads based on authority of willpower, then those they lead either conform or they shatter. And that was the old paradigm. Tainug is a totally different style. Pleasure. Tainug is pleasure. Tainug tzitzu. It attracts. It doesn't mean that we're no longer leading. It doesn't mean that we're no longer involved in our children's lives. It doesn't mean that we've abandoned them, God forbid. It doesn't mean that now that we can't beat them with the maklochevlum, we have nothing to offer them. To the contrary, now we've started influencing them for real. The real influence. You see, when, when you break somebody, that's not influence. That's coercion. You've left them a shell of themselves. All you've done is you've forced them to do what you need to make them do. And maybe in certain contexts and maybe in certain eras in history that was, that was necessary. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't live in that era. I only live now on the cusp of the redemption. So we don't break people anymore. But here's the thing. Who has more influence? The one who breaks or the one who attracts? When you break somebody, there's nobody left over after the process. When you attract somebody, the process is just beginning. Want to give me the... Sure, why not? Thank you. Oh, you got to put the thing on there. Okay, fine. They're going to give me a, a mic stand over here. The, uh, that's the, you're going to see, that's the Makal Noyam, the mic stand. <laughs> There's a pleasant stick that I can put the mic on. You let me know when it's ready. Okay. Broke my train of thought. What are we talking about tonight? <laughs> Parenting? Yeah? What? You have a question? What? Yeah, sure. We get the questions at the end. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about the old paradigm and the new paradigm. Breaking as opposed to attracting. The, the misconception is, and I understand where this mis misconception comes from, it comes from the fact that we've been doing it this way for thousands of years. So we automatically associate parenting with harshness, and when we can no longer be harsh, we feel like we can no longer parent. 
So I understand where the misconception comes from because it's based on thousands of years of establishing certain patterns that become very ingrained. We're very used to this. We're very comfortable this way. And this was handed down to us generation after generation. So it's very hard to all of a sudden learn a new style. But, but here's the thing. When we can set down the makal chevlim, authority that is based on dominating others, overpowering others. It's not that now we have no more way of relating to them. To the contrary, we can relate to them now on such a deep level because now we're, we're dealing with the person, with the person's thoughts and feelings, with their uniqueness. When you're breaking people and overpowering them, then really it's one size fits all then it really isn't about the personality of the, of the child or the student. To the contrary, all that gets erased as they become dominated. But when we're attracting them, not breaking them, but leaving them intact, to the contrary, not only just leaving them intact, but helping them to grow and to foster themselves as interesting people with, I know interesting is a swear word in the from community. You know that it is, right? I'll prove it to you. Somebody calls you for a shidduch reference. Say, you're already laughing. <laughs> What's she like? Well, she's interesting. <laughs> right? That's it. That's, you're done. Interesting. Do you know, by the way, outside of our community, the word interesting just means interesting? <laughs> it just means an interesting person. Like, oh, you know, she's got some color to her. Like, that's, that's considered a good thing. People might even, like, desire that. But I know in our community, that's, and that's a leftover from the old paradigm, from the Makal Chevlin, because people who are interesting are getting in the way of what society needs to do. Society needs to crush everybody. But that's not what we do anymore. What? Oh, you got water for me? What happened with the mic stand? No mic stand, but water. Okay. Let's make a bracha here. That's good. All right. <sighs> They're taking good care of me. By the way, what, what are these? What's the, like, the, in the back there, that table? <laughs> Salad bar? It's a women's event. <laughs> Salad bar. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's Junior Nache, very classy. Salad bar. But it's, it's interesting because nobody ever eats from the salad bar. At the end of every woman's event, they throw away so much food. But if you don't have it, then God forbid. Okay. So, uh, let's talk more about this. What does this mean? <sighs> to honor the personality and the uniqueness of a child to actually value the fact that they have their own personality. Because in the old paradigm, if I'm your teacher or your parent and you're my student or my child and you have a personality, that can be a problem, that can be disruptive. But in the new paradigm, to the contrary, I want you, I want to bring you close to me. I don't want to make you into something you're not. I want you to be you. Ah, here it is. And with all your unique talents and perspectives that Hashem gave you, I want to teach you how to use those qualities in the best possible way. That's what the Makal Noyim is all about. It's about attracting people and instead of taking away their personality, teaching them to be the best version of who they already are. Teaching them how to figure out what they're good at and be even better. That's the new paradigm. So what does this look like? I'll tell you a story about the Lubavitcher Rebbe and a 19-year-old girl. There's a book called Guidance from the Rebbe by Peter Calms from London, England. 
And again, this is a Crown Heights crowd, so I'm going to ask you, have you guys ever seen that book? Yeah? You ever noticed that the picture on the cover of the book is a drawing of the Rebbe? Yeah, it's a drawing of the Rebbe. It's, a, it's like purple colored. Yeah, you know who drew that cover, that picture that's on the cover, the picture of the Rebbe was drawn by Peter Kalm's daughter, Tanya. She was an artist. She drew that picture. The second time she was in Yechidus, when she was 19 years old, the first time was when she was 16. And her father brought her into Yechidus. And she had just finished the first year of a two-year program in Eretz Yisrael, what we call, uh, Lubavitchers aren't so familiar with it, but a program called Michlala. And she had done the first program, the first year, and she didn't want to go back because she had, or she felt she had artistic talent. So she wanted to go to art school. And uh, she told the Rebbe that's what she wants to do. Now, picture this. Imagine this. Imagine a Frum girl comes to her Frum father and says, I'm not going back to seminary. I want to go to art school. So everyone's going to freak out, right? Everyone's going to panic. No, absolutely not. Oh, no, you can't yell at them because then you'll break them and then they'll fry out. So, okay, fine. All right, whatever you want. Right? We feel like those are our only choices. Two choices. Meaner than mean or totally permissive. And I have a second cup of water. Okay, thank you. With all the water up here, I'm going to last for hours up here. But I'm going to try to take it easy on you. L'chaim. It's just, well, I know it's Crown Heights. You might think this is Exxon Neinsicker, but it's just water. Good old, good old H2O. So imagine a 19-year-old girl says she's not going back to seminary. She wants to go to art school. So we don't know how to respond to that. Like, either we do the old style and we just totally shut it down. No way, young lady, you're not, that's crazy. No, you're not doing it. Or we say, oh, you don't do the old style, it'll, it's too scary, you know, you don't know what'll happen if you shut her down, so then you just say, oh, okay, certainly, yes, of course, art school. Like, those are the only two choices. So Baruch Hashem, her father, had Seichel, and he said, talk to the Rebbe. Talk to the Rebbe. So she did. She was in Yechidus, and she told the Rebbe what her plans were. So, I want to ask you a question. Do you think, we have, we have two options. Do you think, option one is shut her down. Option two is let her do whatever the heck she wants. So I want to ask you a question, if you don't know this story yet. Do you think that Rebbe did option one, do you think that Rebbe shut her down? No, you all know that the Rebbe didn't shut her down because you know your Rebbe. Option two, did the Rebbe just let her do whatever she wants? No. So you guys already intuitively know that those are not the only two options because you know that your Rebbe wouldn't have done either of those. Now, maybe you're going to think, the Rebbe's a tzaddik, the Rebbe can come up with a third option. Well, yeah, that's true, but here's the cool thing. We get to learn from the Rebbe. We get to emulate the Rebbe. And since this approach is not just something I have one anecdote to illustrate, but rather it is demonstrative of a cohesive approach that the Rebbe explained in detail for decades. So therefore, it's not an isolated incident that we may hear and then we'll forget, but rather it reinforces 
an entire worldview that you will see the Rebbe repeat over and over and over and over again, consistently. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. So the Rebbe spoke with her like an adult, like somebody with reason, somebody with a brain. The Rebbe said, you know, every morning in our morning blessings, we dive and we ask Hashem, do not bring us to a test. Then why would you put yourself in a place where you're going to be constantly tested? Why would you want to be in an environment that is going to expose you to things that are going to be challenging, difficult for you? Do you see... And don't tell me that this is the Rebbe. You can't do this. You can, and you have to, and you will. Do you see how the Rebbe immediately made it about what's good for the girl? See, it's so hard to do this because if you have an ego, then children will push your buttons and they'll threaten your ego. And it's scary. And then what does the ego want to do? It wants to fight back. It feels threatened, right? It's very scary. These kids, they're going to do crazy things. And so then what do we start doing? We start panicking. We start thinking about how, how, how much it terrifies us. And the second you go into a fear loop where, where you're afraid and then you try to control the people who are frightening you and then they act more unruly because you're trying to control them so you get more afraid and then you try to control them more. The second you go into that fear loop, you're basically just talking to yourself because at that point, you're not thinking about what's good for the other person. You're thinking about what's good for you. Or probably more accurately, you're thinking about what, what, what's bad for you, what you don't want what you don't want for yourself, how it's going to pain you, how it's going to scare you for this person to do that behavior. But what did the Rebbe do? The Rebbe didn't speak like that. The Rebbe didn't say, how could you do this to me? <laughs> you ever caught yourself saying that? Or various iterations of that? If you've never said that or anything like that, you probably don't have teenagers yet. That's. <sighs> so, but the Rebbe didn't say, don't do this to me. The Rebbe said, don't do this to yourself. Why would you do this to yourself? You're going to cause yourself. Disharmony. I want to point out another thing there. So much to learn from this, but when the Rebbe is concerned that Tanya is going to cause herself conflict by going to art school and then be tested, there's an assumption, there's an underlying assumption that Rebbe is making. And it's a consistent assumption that the, the Rebbe makes about everyone that the Rebbe interacts with. And what is that assumption? The Rebbe is assuming, when the Rebbe says, if you, young lady, go to art school and you're exposed to these things that run counter to Yiddishkeit, it's going to bother you. What's the assumption there that Rebbe is making? That they care. That's right! That they care! That is one of the fundamental tenets of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's worldview. And you could say it in the, in the way that we know how to quote it, and it almost doesn't mean anything because we've heard these words, that this combination of words so often that a Jew cannot be torn away from God. Every Jew desires to remain Jewish and to do God's will. And we say them so often, they almost become like, like slogans. And they lose their meaning. So step back for a second and look what, when somebody really believes about somebody else that they are a neshama 
and that they want what's right and they want what's good and they want to be close to Hashem more than anything else. When somebody believes that about another person, you want to know what it looks like? It looks like the way the Rebbe spoke to 19-year-old Tanya. I'm concerned if you'll go to art school, it's going to bother you. It's not about me. It's about you. I know we all say that. It's not about me. It's about, but it, no, the way that Rebbe is saying it, it's really, it's not about me. It's about you, my child. I don't want you to suffer. You understand? I just want to make sure that this is, this is clear. Not just, I don't want you to suffer, meaning you're going to become spiritually damaged, God forbid, and you'll suffer in ways that you don't even know about and you don't even care about. No, but what I'm saying is something that's much harder to say, and we really have to be super spiritual to be able to say it and mean it, which is, I know you, my child, and I know you are so sensitive, it's going to bother you. Not just deep down on a neshama level, but... In a revealed way, it's going to cause you angst. It's going to cause you conflict, conflicted emotions. And I don't want that for you. You know, there's a letter that Eber wrote in English to someone who said that he, he was born a man, but he always felt like he should be a woman. It's a one-page letter in English, and... I, I could st sit and study that letter all night, but I'll just bring out one point from it that has to do with what we're talking about right now. And that is, at, at the end of the letter, the Rebbe says that if you find this troublesome, you should speak to a therapist, preferably a God-fearing one. In other words, the Rebbe's not saying, well, you're crazy, you gotta talk to a therapist. The Rebbe's saying, I'm worried that you shouldn't feel distress. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to have somebody to talk this out with. Now, obviously, when you talk it out with somebody, I want them to be God-fearing. But that's, again, because I want you to actually get clarity so that you'll feel good. It's all about compassion. I should point out also in that letter, it's another thing that's consistent with something I'm pointing out about the Tanya story, and that is... What is the main point that Abba makes to this person writing this letter? That Abba says, there are, in Torah, there are obligations for men and obligations for women. And if you do something that can make your status questionable, then you are going to confuse yourself. So remember that point I made earlier about the assumption, the great assumption? that the Rebbe makes about all of us? The assumption that what? That you care. So the Rebbe tells this person, yeah, I think you want to be careful about changing your gender because you're going to cause yourself confusion. You won't know whether to put on tefillin or to light Shabbos candles. Now, who says they care? Who says they care? Maybe they... Maybe this person wasn't even religious. But do you understand the way that the Rebbe views all of us? And the way that we're supposed to view each other, really? Because in chapter 32 of Tanya, we're supposed to see all of each other as souls. And if you see someone as a soul, well, what does a soul want? A soul wants to do what Hashem wants. A soul wants to be close to Hashem. So if you see somebody as a soul, what assumptions do you make about what they really want and what will bring them true happiness? You understand now there's no conflict between personal fulfillment and being Torah observant. There's no conflict. That's the old paradigm. The old paradigm is you don't get that personal fulfillment. You have to be Torah observant. The new paradigm is what do you think true personal fulfillment really is for a neshama? Being Torah observant. So the Rebbe tells Tanya, you're going to put yourself in a situation where you're going to be tested. It's not going to be pleasant for you. So she says back, 
And by the way, just the fact that a 19-year-old girl felt comfortable enough to, to push back and to answer the Rebbe, after the Rebbe made his point, the fact that she felt comfortable enough to answer, by the way, is to me the biggest miracle of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Because I know plenty of parents whose children are not comfortable expressing themselves to them. Whose children feel deep fear of rejection and will not speak openly to their parents. They just learn how to be very, very good at secrecy, which brings shame and self-loathing. And yet this girl knew that she could be open with the Rebbe. So what did she, what did she tell the Rebbe? She said, But I want to know if I have what it takes. I have a talent. Hashem gave it to me. And I want to know if I have what it takes. It's a good point, isn't it? Now, if we were in fear mode and the 19-year-old made a good point, that would be terrifying. Oh no, she just made a good point. And then we have to shut it down. Well, I'm not talking any further about this craziness. But what did the Rebbe do? So the Rebbe said, well, that's a good point. And you should try to develop your artistic skills. But I'll tell you, actually, art schools aren't even the best place to do that. Actually, you don't get a lot of attention, and it's really mostly just about the, the culture over there, which is part of the concern also, the, the environment. If you're really interested in developing your skills, hire a tutor. Get one-on-one -on -one training. It'll be tailor-made for you. You'll actually get attention, and you'll get to develop your art. But again, that response that the Rebbe gave wasn't a push-off. That wasn't like a, oh no, I'm so afraid this kid's going to do something. I got to figure out a way to thwart it. I got to figure out a way to create an obstacle. The Rebbe was able to offer that, her that, that, that solution because the Rebbe is still in the mode of, it's not about me, it's about you. How can I help you? How can I best facilitate your growth? How can I best help you to be the best version of yourself? And if you say being an artist is part of your gift to Hashem and part of your fulfilling your potential that God gave you, great, let me help you do that. But let me really help you do that. Why don't you hire an art tutor? The story isn't over, though. Because... Uh, the Rebbe says to her, uh, you wrote in your letter. You know how Yechidus would work. People would bring in a letter because a lot of people would be tongue-tied. Baruch Hashem, 19-year-old Tanya was not tongue-tied and she was able to talk with the Rebbe. But um, a lot of people wouldn't really be able to remember what they wanted to say, so they would bring in a letter. And the Rebbe would read the letter, they say that the Rebbe would put the paper on a pencil and scroll, like he would twist the pencil and scroll the, the paper like this and read it line by line very quickly. So at this point, the Rebbe referred to Tanya's letter and says to her, and this, this part is mind-blowing because, again, if you are the parent here in this situation, you just closed the deal. You shot down the scary art school idea. You offered her an alternative. She's ready to take the alternative. Like, leave it alone. But, see, that's, that's fear-based. That's, I'm afraid of what you might really want. But when we look at the other person as a soul, we're not afraid of what they might want. We want to bring out more of what they really want. We're not threatened by our children's personalities. We cherish their personalities and want them to develop them as much as possible. 
So even though technically, from a negotiation standpoint, that Abba had won, that Abba said at this point, in your letter, you said a word that I didn't like. You said that you are committed to Chabad. This 19-year-old girl writing to the Rebbe and telling the Rebbe, I'm committed to Chabad. What's wrong with that? The Rebbe said, and this is very interesting, in Lubavitch, we don't like commitment. We like inspiration. We can't make people do anything. We show them the truth, and then we hope that they will do what's best. So I don't want your commitment. I want you to make a decision that you think is right. Tell me how many of us here are brave enough to say that in that exact same scenario. Where did the Rebbe's bravery come from? And I hope I'm not being overly presumptuous. I think it's obvious. How did the Rebbe have the courage to tell this girl, I don't want to force you to do anything. I want you to do what you believe is right in your own heart. How did the Rebbe have the confidence to allow her to do that? Because the Rebbe had confidence in her. So you can't look down at people and be suspicious of their motives and at the same time trust them. The two don't go together. If you're suspicious of somebody, you think that they have nefarious motives that you need to thwart and present obstacles to, so the best you're going to be able to do as a parent, as a teacher, is to just control them in spite of themselves, which may be the old paradigm of the makl chayvlim. But in the new paradigm of the makl noyim, where instead of rotzen and sheer willpower, it's now tainug and pleasure, we can relax and allow our children to be themselves because we have faith that their true selves are something wonderful because we believe that there's a neshama. We believe that that is the true identity of every Jew. We don't just say it. We feel it. And it totally changes the, the entire rapport. The Rebbe wouldn't have been able to have that conversation with Tanya if he was suspicious of her motives, if he looked down at her, if he thought she didn't really care. She's just a teenager. She just wants to have fun. She just, she's selfish, you know, teenagers, they don't care about anybody else, they're not respectful. You see the results, what happens when we think of people in terms like that. We break people. And in the end, we don't even get what we think we wanted anyways, because Either they're broken, and how well can they really function when we've broken them? Or they do the sensible thing and they resist being broken, their survival mechanism kicks in, and they run away and they rebel. And now out of survival, out of sheer survival, they throw off the yoke, and whose fault was it really? It was ours because we were overly oppressive for no reason. But you understand, you understand, I wanna make sure this is very clear. The alternative to being domineering and overly oppressive and shame-based and forceful, the alternative to that is not just dropping everything and saying, do whatever you want. The alternative is the makal noyam. Lead. Lead with love. Lead with pleasure. Lead with joy. Lead with attraction. Lead. Yes, lead. Show them the way to go. Give them goals. Tell them your opinion. Share your experience. You're older and wiser. 
but do it with love and do it with concern for them, not out of fear for what's going to happen to you if they don't listen. You know, there was uh, an American author, Herman Woke, who was one of the most celebrated authors in 20th century American literature. He wrote several bestsellers. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he happened to also be Torah observant his entire life. He grew up in the Bronx. And you have to understand, he grew up in the Bronx during an era when very few American Jews were observant, especially American Jewish children. If people were from, it was the older generation. Most of the immigrant families, Torah observance did not get transmitted to the next generation. Very, very few. Very few from families in the early 1900s. And yet, Herman Woke was Torah observant, Shabbos observant his entire life. And uh, he ended up in Yechidus with the, with the Rebbe. Actually, when the Rebbe turned 70, so Herman Woke was the one who was sent as the representative of the, of the United States government to bring the President of the United States birthday wishes to the Rebbe. President was Nixon at the time, and Herman Woke brought the, uh, the presidential birthday letter to the Rebbe. And uh, Herman Woke is speaking to the Rebbe and saying, with all due respect, Lubavitcher Rebbe, I'm from here. <laughs> okay, like, I grew up with these people, and I know what is possible with them. I know their mentality. And I just think that it's very unrealistic to, 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 to have the goals that the Rebbe has with, with American Jewry. It's just, it's not going to happen. Again, Herman Wolk grew up from in America during that era. The Rebbe came over, born in, in, in Nikolaev, came over in the 40s during World War II. So Herman Woke is basically just trying to do the Rebbe a favor and say, look, <laughs> I, I know this demographic, and I'm telling you, this is, this is what's possible, this is what's not possible. So the Rebbe says to Herman Woke, don't, don't speak about American Jews that way. I love American Jews. It's very interesting. I love American Jews. What are American Jews known for, right? The chutzpah, the anti-authoritarian attitude, right? Because that's the American uh, spirit of rugged individualism, the lone cowboy riding out into the sunset, as opposed to the old world, the altaheim, where it's about tradition and about loyalty and about family and community and rules. So the Rebbe says to Herman Woke, I love American Jews. <laughs> so Herman Wilk says, Lubavitcher Rebbe, do you really think that you can tell American Jews to do anything? And the Rebbe says, no. No, you can't tell American Jews to do anything. But you can teach them to do everything. I think today we are all American Jews. You can't tell us to do anything. We're not going to listen. We'll do the opposite. But you can teach us, teach us to do everything. If you'll really connect, if you'll really care, if you'll really do it for me, not for you, then I'll listen to you and, 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 I'll, and I'll let you teach me how to live. You know what discipline means? The English word discipline. How would you translate that into Lush and Kurdish? Oynish 
to discipline is to punish. No, that's not what it means. It's not oinish. It's not punishment. Discipline, the word discipline, comes from the word disciple. A disciple is a Talmud. Discipline means to make somebody a Talmud, a student. A student. A disciple means a student. So to discipline a child means to make your child your student. That means to attract them, to build them up, to make them love who they are and go out and show the world how great they are. That's what it means to have a student. So in this new paradigm, we haven't gotten rid of discipline. No, to the contrary, now we're just getting started with real discipline. We're really making disciples. We're educating our children. Instead, instead of dominating them, we're teaching them. And what does it mean to teach them? It means, educate the child according to the child. Understand who they are, their strengths, their weaknesses, their fears, their hopes, their dreams. That's all part of education. That's not an impediment. When we're dominating because we're afraid that this child will develop a will and this child will be able to defy us and we wish that they were just little babies again so that we could just put them in their crib and put them in timeout. And when we're leading from fear, then my child's personality is a threat to me. But if I'm raising a disciple, like the Rebbe raised disciples, the Rebbe raised disciples that he set loose upon the entire world to bring light and love to the entire universe. If we can be like that and raise our children as disciples, that means that we love the fact that they have a personality. And we want to develop that. We want to work with that. You're good at art? Let's work with that. You have a certain type of a learning style? So instead of crushing you and telling you that you have to learn like every other kid in your class, let's work with you and develop the way that you learn. If you have a certain type of a personality, instead of labeling you as disruptive and saying, we just want you to be quiet, we just want you to, to march in line, figure out how to channel this trait, figure out how to give a child an opportunity to shine and to have a positive self-image that's related to his unique talents and abilities. That's if you're raising a disciple. So in other words, we love the fact that our children shine. We want them to make choices. We want them to figure things out for themselves. That's not a threat. That's the goal. I heard something incredible recently about the Rebbe's approach. Um, people know what I'm into, at least what I'm publicly into, know that I'm into uh, the Rebbe's letters. You might not know my, all my personal hobbies, but if you know what I'm into, on a, at least on a public level, you know that I'm into the Rebbe's letters. And I uh, did a couple times, 30 letters in 30 days, where we learned a letter from the Igris every day for 30 days. And uh, I heard something really incredible recently when I finished my most recent 30 letters in 30 days. Somebody told me that Rav Gavriel Tzinner, the Rav, the Paisik, who's a very, very respected Torah authority in the entire Jewish world. Um, he, was, he was asked, when he speaks to other rabbonim, other rabbis, about the Rebbe's Torah, what does he tell them to try to get them to start learning, to learn from the Rebbe? Is it Sichas? Is it Maimarim? Which sikh is which my modem? So interestingly, he said, No, I tell them 
learn the Rebbe's letters. Lent seine Michtovim, learn his letters. Because you have thousands of these letters, and they're to all different people, on all different levels, dealing with all different types of life's challenges. And here what Rav Tzinner said. This blew me away. He said, what is the Igris Kedish? What's the Rebbe's letters? He demands from every single one of them, of the people who write to him, and there's not one mean word. To me, that sums up the Rebbe's entire approach. He demands from everybody. The Rebbe doesn't leave anybody alone. The Rebbe doesn't tell anybody, you're good, stay that way, never change. The Rebbe's always pushing more, more, more. And yet, at the very same time, there's not one mean word, not one mean word, forget about a mean sentence, not a mean word. It's all chesed, it's all love. But if you understand this approach, it's actually not so mystifying. It actually makes sense. How was the Rebbe able to demand so much from everybody? Because it was all love and acceptance. See, this is the Chiddush. And it's, it's, it's a subtle concept. And it's not an easy one to grasp, especially because it's a new thing. This only is a new thing that just got introduced in recent years as we're getting closer to Mashiach. Helping people be better does not require being mean to them. And to the contrary, the nicer you are, the more you'll help them be better. And the more you need to help them be better, the nicer you need to be. In other words, how was the Rebbe able to get away with demanding so much from everybody? I mean, people are free to go. If they felt too much pressure, they could just check out. How was it that the Rebbe would demand more from people and they would come back to him? You never asked this question? It's more than nice when somebody believes in you. It, it's, it's essential to life. I need someone to believe in me. And when I find somebody who sees greatness in me, even if at first it scares me because I don't see that greatness in myself, but that becomes the relationship that I keep coming back to. Because every time I come back to this person, they see a greater version of me and force me to live up to it. What does it say in chapter 2 of Tanya? Ladov kavai to cleave to Hashem is to cleave to Talmide Chachomim. And that's a Gemara, but how does Tanya explain it? That each and every one of us comes from Chachmei Allah. You're all godly beings. But as you came down to this world, you lost touch with that. And you lost touch with your greatness and your infinite potential. So what do you have to do? You connect to a Rebbe, and the Rebbe sees that you are still you, that you did not lose your greatness, that you are still a chelek elekami mal, mamash, mamash means even in this world. You're the same you from up in Chochme Ilah, and when the Rebbe sees that in you, you start to believe it's true. And you start to live like it. And then you're connected to God. To your own godliness. To the godliness that was always within you. And I want to explain something to you. I told you earlier that the Friedrich Rebbe told a story privately to the Rebbe because it was Rebbe training material 
And the Rebbe shared that story with us. Why did the Rebbe share that story and so many other stories with us that really only a Rebbe needs to know? It's okay. It's okay to say it. The Rebbe said it already. The last dollars, the day before Chav Zayin Adar, somebody came to the Rebbe. His name was Gabriel Aram. He was writing an article about the Rebbe in Lifestyles magazine in honor of the Rebbe's 90th birthday. The company led him to Toronto to publish a condemned journal in Yiddish. And in the occasion of your 90th birthday, we are publishing a special issue of the magazine. And the special article about your life will be written by Rabbi Adin Steinzels in your honor. Came to the Rebbe in the dollar line and asked the Rebbe, What's the Rebbe's statement? He wanted to include it in the article. What's the Rebbe's message in honor of his upcoming 90th birthday? If I may ask you a simple question, Rebbe, uh, on the occasion of your 90th birthday, what is your message to the world? And the Rebbe says that 90 is tzaddik, which means that every Jew can be a tzaddik. 90, that means tzaddik. And that is a direct indication for every Jew to become a real tzaddik. By the way, I don't know if I should tell you the next line. <laughs> Gabriel Aram asked the Rebbe, he was stunned, he was stunned by that. But he says, what's the Rebbe's message for the whole world? It's your message to the general world. Not just the Jewish world, but the world in general. Because it wasn't even a Jewish magazine. Lifestyles isn't the Jewish magazine. So what's the Rebbe's message to non-Jews? And the Rebbe says, same thing, that through their seven Noahide laws, every human being can be a tzaddik. It's the same thing that's about the seven Noahide laws. Was, that was the last dollars. That was the, the day before the Rebbe's stroke. So this, this was the message that the Rebbe left to us, was that each and every one of us can be the tzaddik. And what is the tzaddik? The tzaddik is the one, like the Rebbe, who sees the greatness and the godliness and the infinity in everybody else. And that means that we need to see others in this same light. And if that's a little bit scary to start looking at everybody like this, at least just start with your own kids. Assume the best about them. Assume that their motives are pure. After all, they don't just have a neshama, they are a neshama. And what does a neshama want other than to do good things. And we don't have to repress our children's personalities. We need to develop their personalities because at the end of the day, the more we can reveal in them, the more we can bring out, the more we're giving to God. The old model was breaking and repressing and fitting people into a tight box. And maybe that had a place. Maybe that was necessary. I can't judge. I wasn't there. Maybe when the Ra was so intense and so strong, we needed to be that rigid and we needed to be that tough in order to survive through centuries of, of, of exile. But Mashiach is coming. And it's time to really lead and to really guide and to really demand greatness from our children. And the way that we do that is by thinking well of them and loving them and showing them that we care about their well-being before we think about our own concerns. Like I said, it's a new way of parenting. It's a new way of leading. And we haven't mastered it yet. We're going through growing pains. I mean, really, I could be talking about the whole world right now. Everything I'm saying, I'm saying it about Crown Heights. But really, 
This applies to the entire world right now. We're, we're trying to figure this out. We realized that you can't crush people. But we haven't yet gotten good. You understand what I'm saying when I say we haven't yet gotten good at what you do instead of crushing. <laughs> we, we don't crush people anymore because it doesn't work. It, does, it doesn't work. But what do you do instead of crushing? What you do instead is you believe in people, you, you really think well of them, you tell them how well you think of them, you trust them, you create more possibilities for them, not less. You bring out more of their personality, not less. And then what happens is you have disciples. People who you've trained so well that you can leave the room and they're going to continue to behave. Because they're not doing it based on fear. They're not doing it because you force them to do something against their will. They're doing it because you successfully installed a moral compass into them. If our children will only behave when we're watching them, and when they're afraid, when they're afraid of, 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 of repercussions, we haven't taught them anything. Well, I, I, let me correct that. We taught them one thing. We taught them how to get good at not getting caught. An educator told me, a Jewish educator, and uh, he, does, he doesn't want to be quoted, so I'm not going to say the name. But uh, he said... You know, I was honored for decades in the field of Jewish education, and they were all talking about what I accomplished with so many thousands of students over the years, and look at this school that I built, and he said, you know, it is, it is remarkable, and we do have what to be proud of. He said, but I'll tell you my fear is that we, and he was speaking about our community, the Jewish community, he said, we know how to raise good kids, but I'm not sure if we know how to raise good adults. Meaning, yeah, we can, we can get them to do what they're supposed to do while we're still controlling them, until we don't control them anymore. But what do they do when nobody's watching? What do they do when they grow up and they move on and they have their own life. Did we ever build them up strongly enough that they have their own internal sense of right and wrong? And he was very concerned whether or not that that was happening. So I don't want to speak doom and gloom. I want to speak positive and say like this, the Lubavitcher Rebbe already gave us the roadmap decades ago. The methodology is very, very clearly laid out and very simple. You want to raise great adults, meaning people who are able to go out into the world independently and make good choices on their own because they actually care, not because they were forced. If you want to raise adults who are able to, to be trusted and who can raise the next generation, so we know the way to do it. And, it, and it, maybe it's frustrating to hear it phrased this way, but I'm going to say it as it is. There's no choice anymore. There's no other educational method that will work. There's only one way to do it now. And that is to see your child as a soul. With everything that that means and everything that that entails. And doggone it, stop being afraid of your child. Be in awe of them. <laughs> you know the difference between fear and awe? They're very close, but they're not the same. I fear losing something that I think I have. I'm in awe of that which I realize I can never possess because it is far too great.
far too awesome. Be in awe of your child. Do you know who you're talking to? Echelik elikam mimal mamish. A neshama. Elikus. Infinity. I know that sounds very lofty. I know it sounds very abstract. I know especially in Crown Heights, when I use terms like that, it's like, come on, dude. We, we've heard that talk. We, we're, we're used to that. We're, come on, enough with the slogans. Enough with the, the Hasidic sound bites. But I'm telling you, there's nothing else that will work anymore. The only approach is the spiritual approach. The only approach is to see your child's soul. The only approach is to bring out their godliness. That's what the Rebbe did with everyone he met. And that's what we need to do. Ultimately, with everyone we meet as well, but we can start at home. You could start believing in your child's soul. Somebody asked me earlier if I'll do Q&A. Should I do Q&A? Should I have enough trust? That'll be a good question. Okay. A leap of faith over here. Should I take, yeah.